Well, we're back again. Um, you know, I'm always concerned that, uh, you know, it's going over so much history and what we're covering that you'll lose interest and you won't hang in there with me. But the truth is, you know, I can kind of speed through things and get to the main point, but I'm afraid that whenever we do that, you know, unless you have some kind of background in this, maybe you do. And if you do, I'm really sorry that we're going slow, but I think we're still covering some things within that history that maybe we've just kind of overlooked or made assumptions about, you know, had our own framework for. So hopefully we're beginning to uh, get rid of some of those and develop a more biblical look at things. Like I said, the end times is so difficult. It's such a mess in uh, so many different interpretations. It's very hard and it's confusing to everyone, to us as individuals. So, you know, for all those reasons, we're just trying to go through and look at the scripture starting the Old Testament and understand how these things tie together and how they affect those who write about these things and how they affect you and I and what should we understand about them. We started last time with the Old Testament, remember, and we looked at some different things there. And one of the big things that we really uh, talked about was this framework, that we get some kind of framework because whether we like to admit it or not, even though we might say, hey, we're Bible students, we take things in context. But the truth is that because of the things around us that we're affected by, you know, there are some things that we just, without thinking, we read into it, something that's not meant to be there. And that begins to cause problems. I started off by looking at a particular book uh, that, um, you know, I had uh, I ha had shown you that was whenever I was growing up, um, actually uh, 20 years old at the time, was very concerning to me because I thought this was it, this was the end, and, you know, it just seemed so factual in the way it was done that it really, it really scared me. And last time we talked about just, uh, we looked at the, the feast of the, of the seven feast of Israel. You know, we kind of talked about those things and we looked at it, that they would use those things to get to the understanding that, well, this must be the feast of the trumpets and the day of atonement. And, you know, God's getting ready to tabernacle win it with us. And they would look at those things, seeing that the first feast, and we looked at those spring feasts and saw some of their fulfillments in Jesus and try to get an understanding on how that people arrive at those things. But one thing that we didn't talk about was the year 1988. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why did they pick the year 1988? And not only pick the year 1988, but uh, turns out they gave us 88 reasons. You know, why 1988? So um, what's so great about that year? Well, you know, I'm going to try to point you uh, in an understanding of this. This is a, a paper and it says the state of Israel is born, the Palestine Post. Now, uh, what makes this paper important is, and I, I've tried to find something on this that you could actually see. Let me see if I can even bring it up closer. It says Jerusalem, Sunday, May I believe that's the 16th, 1948, right there. So, you know, what I want you to understand is it is that event of Israel being declared a nation, a country, a state that has been the marker for so many modern day prophecies. You know, they have taken, and you might wonder, well, okay, 1948 to 1988, why, why there? Okay, well, let me uh, see here. You know, what does it have to do with that? Matthew in chapter 24 and verse 34 is the main reason that people seem to fall in these dates. And uh, the reason is that in that verse... Uh, Jesus made a statement here, and let me get that up a little bit bigger for you to see. Matthew twenty four thirty four. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. 
Well, maybe without knowing exactly what's being talked about, you might not understand what that verse is about. But if you're familiar with all, with any kind of uh, prophetic things about the end of time, you, you've heard of Matthew 24. And the things that are stated in Matthew 24 are continuously used for the signs of the time. That's uh, There's so many things in that chapter that people will take and just grab onto and say the signs of the time. And obviously, uh, along with this right here. Now, one thing about this that we need to ask is whenever he says generation, what does that mean? Some say it means a race, like a race of people. But that would be a far uh, explanation for the word from the Greek. You know, in, in the Greek, uh, th this particular word that's used, generation is about 40 years. Um, so some have asked the question, since they kind of knew that, that, you know, this word leaned towards that idea. They've, they've said, well, uh, Jesus said that uh, these things, uh, you know, this generation, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place all these terrible things that he talked about, uh, because of that, you know, since they, they decided, well, the word does have something to do with, a, with the time period, a generation of people, 40 year period that, uh, they've asked the question, well, well, you know, Gina, Jesus said these things would take place in this generation, but what generation was he talking about? And then they just take that and move it up to our generation. And then they kind of start that generation in a, you know, in 1948 and, Obviously, today, that causes some issues, too, in thinking. So uh, some went back and tried to get some other date. Uh, just for your understanding, you can go back and look at this yourself. You want to do a little bit of, of Greek study on your own. But uh, know here that uh, this word here, uh, gena, is the word that's used for generation there in the Greek. And it's used repeatedly in the New Testament as generation living at the time spoken, you know, whenever Jesus is used it. And that's just not necessarily just a, a random use by different writers. I'm talking about Jesus using that word. And whenever he does, he's, he's speaking to the generation right there in front of him. And it's, it's easy to see whenever we read through, but for some reason they get to Matthew 24, they don't like the context, doesn't seem to match what they expect it to match. So therefore, uh, they want to move it on to something else. <clears throat> You know, whenever we do look at this Matthew 24, and we're not particularly looking at it today, but yet the things we're going to talk about are connected in here. They're interwoven into this. You know, the events that Jesus spoke of uh, until this verse, that uh, 34 in Matthew 34, they should have seen their fulfillment in the first century. And what I mean by that is, that basically every other use of the time that Jesus has spoken of generation, he's been speaking of the one he's talking to. So suddenly, for no apparent reason, we just other than we just don't like what he said as to fitting, uh, so we just pull it out and we say, well, he's talking about some generation, but I don't know what generation he's talking about. We'll just have to wait and see. Then, of course, you know, whenever Israel goes back to their homeland in 1948, that's a big Bible marker. And some have marked 1967 because it was a, a little Jewish war there that lasted for a short period of time. But the thing is, in the things that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, about these things will not pass until this generation, or, you know, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. It fits the context of Matthew uh, chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Now, let me bring that up to you as he started this uh, chapter here. So you can read it with me. This is in Matthew and chapter 24 and verse 1 and 2. It says, And Jesus came out of the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Now, that's pretty blunt right there that, you know, basically, uh, you know, they go out and you got to realize 
um, whenever they're looking at the temple in Jesus' day, it's under construction, and it will not be finished until, I think, 62 or 63 A.D. So whenever Jesus sees it, Herod the Great, I believe, had started a uh, rebuilding of the temple in uh, making it just grander, trying to, he was trying to, uh, just, you know, get some points with the Jewish people there. So he starts this and, uh, you know, th this thing is, is pretty awesome, I suppose, and how it's looking. And they pointed out to him, you know, they're like, look, wow, look at all these temple buildings. And then Jesus comes off with this statement. Look, you know, uh, you know, do you see all these things? And I say, you not one stone will be left on top of another. Okay. And that is the start of the conversation in Matthew 24 right there. So, you know, we should, whenever we read these things uh, about what's getting ready to take place uh, that Jesus tells them about, I think it is very important, you know, that we notice that, you know, they had asked the questions here, um, you know, and it would be hard for us to escape. Let's go back there and see how this plays out. You know, in verse three, it says, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? You know, it's been those last two statements that have thrown people off so much right there in what says, but he says, tell us when will these things happen? And then he begins to go and talk about all the terrible things that's going to take place here. And he's going to take, you know, he, he's going to talk about some things uh, that are easy to see that he's speaking about the temple in here. But then other things that he says just seem so lofty that people have found it difficult to believe that it could possibly be about that. And yet, whenever he gets to verse 34, he assures us by saying, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And then he says in verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In other words, uh, you know, what, what he says is true. Now, in verse 36, you might notice that he gets there and he says, But of that day and hour no one knows. So, you know, in verse 36, he seems to change subject here to something else. Um, but what's interesting is whenever we get there and what he's talking about there, uh, you know, it looks by verse 38. He says, for in those days before the flood, they were eating, uh, drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Uh, you know, I, I mean, basically he says, hey, things are going on as normal right there, you know, as, as far as Jesus' second coming that he's talking about from 36 on. You know, he doesn't he show, you know, he basically tells us, hey, there's no signs that's going to be with this, okay? So he kind of splits up the two, and I think that's pretty evident there to see from the text. Anyway, so, um, you know, obviously people must think that what happened in 1948 when the Jew Jewish people started regathering is very important prophetically. Well, where do they get the reasons for that and why? Well, that's why we're in the Old Testament trying to figure out exactly where much of this comes from. So uh, <clears throat> we ended up last time on the birthrights and the blessings. You remember we were in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, and we saw that statement that mentioned about Judah. Uh, the power kind of went to Judah, but Joseph got the birthright. And then through Joseph, we had looked at uh, Genesis in chapter 48, and we saw that Joseph's son Ephraim is who that blessing and, and the birthright was passed down through. And Ephraim was to be a multitude of nations. And we, we saw that. And we looked at translations on that for the fullness of the Gentiles. And that word could be translated nations, Gentiles, heathen, peoples, just all these different words there um, that we looked at. So basically we saw the throne was going to come through Judah and the scepter should not pass away as he was, uh, as Judah was promised in chapter 49. So we saw that that was to stay with them until Shiloh comes or the Messiah. And that was Jesus. Okay. So we looked at a lot of that. Now, just for our understanding here of, uh, of looking at this, 
Um, you know, we can see that, uh, let me see if I can get this up here in a little bigger screen for you guys, that for as Judah's side goes, the throne went with Judah. And just to make a long story short, um, you know, David, King David, and, uh, obviously a descendant of David is Jesus, the, the Christ, the son of God. And that's what happened there. And we see that the Messiah, Jesus, came through that line right there of, uh, of Judah that we see. But uh, the big question is, and the one that seems to escape everyone, is this other side that we uh, have witnessed on the side of Ephraim. That is just as important. First Chronicles chapter five, verse one and two points that out to us. And yet this one just kind of escapes us. And then it's like, well, you know, yep. Well, there it goes, but I don't know where. And uh, it's easy to follow the one on the throne side to Jesus, but it's not so easy to follow this other. And, or, you know, I think we get the question of why is it there? You know, what, what's the situation? What's the deal? Why, why is God doing this? Okay. So, uh, Let's go back and let's once again try to do some history lessons. Uh, this should be some things that we covered a little bit in last time, and this time we cover them a little better. First of all, we had the twelve, you know, the, the sons of Jacob, but then we have those become the twelve tribes of Israel. And remember, uh, Israel is Jacob's name. His name was changed. We talked about that. And here we have a listing of those 12 tribes. And in there, whenever you look, you don't see Joseph's name. Uh, you see uh, Manash, uh, Manasseh, Naphtali, Azakar, Ephraim, Benjamin, Simeon, Asher, Zebulun, Gad, Dan, Reuben, and Judah. Um, you don't see Levi because Levi wasn't given uh, land like the rest of them. They were the priestly tribe and they were given um, they, they were given, uh, so there were some cities there that they had, but they weren't, it was, didn't get land like the others. And of course you don't see Joseph. So where's Joseph? Well, remember Joseph, his sons, Jacob took, and he said, these sons will carry my name. And so there they are, Manasseh and Ephraim. And if you look there uh, on the map, you can kind of see Manasseh and Ephraim. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, reading through the book of Joshua can explain this a little bit, uh, you know, in, in understanding it. And let's see, I think I got, uh, let's see if I can't bring up another map here. And if I could find a way to, I don't, I don't know, you guys may just have to, there's no good way for me to shrink this map down for you guys to see other than what, what I have here. But anyway, here's another breakdown of the locations and stuff. And if you paid real close attention, you might notice that Dan is is up here uh, at the top on this one. And if we went back to the other one uh, and you could see it, you'd see Dan down here and you don't see Dan up there. And, you know, like what happened to Dan uh, those kind of things. Well, Dan's an interesting story, and in the end, it goes off in idolatry. Um, so it's it's another one of those. They they seem to have the Danites really had a hard time taking their land, is basically what that amounts to. But anyway, uh, that's a look at those twelve tribes that make up Israel right there. Now, so these tribes uh, form a new nation, and that is Israel, the name of Jacob that is is in place here. So we have the start here of a nation, and whenever the nation forms, um, you know, let's see if you if you did your your Old Testament Bible, um, you would have uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, first five books that would be called the Torah, the Law. Uh, the, those those things right there would be the first five books. A lot of names, you know, that we just kind of go for for there. Uh, so and then we have Joshua. So so basically, the first five books, you know, Genesis tells us how all this takes place. Exodus tells us just of that, the Exodus from Egypt, and uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy kind of put all that together with what happens in their forty years in the wilderness. 
And then after the 40 years in the wilderness uh, and Moses passes away, we come to the book of Joshua. And Joshua tells us a time of conquest and whenever they kind of take their land. And that's pretty much where we see this take place at is in the book of Joshua, where uh, this map really starts coming into play at the end where they're all uh, taking their places on there. So <clears throat> after the book of Joshua comes the book of Judges. And we see we go through several judges until we get to the last judge. And, uh, you know, basically, uh, there's some bad things that happen. Whenever we get to uh, the high priest during Eli, uh, the Philistines end up capturing the ark. It's just a mess. But we really see, you know, God is just absolutely, you know, the, the priesthood, you know, Eli's two sons. It's just, it's bad, the things that they're doing. Uh, and I mean really bad. Uh, they're just basically desecrating the temple. Eli's been warned. He doesn't do anything about it. So in, in the long run, you know, the nation just, uh, they lose the ark and they kind of lose their place here for a little while. Uh, there's a little fella, uh, you know, we're in the book of first Samuel and Samuel comes along and Samuel will also represent the last of the judges. So, you know, you kind of have to go and read through judges to understand what I'm talking about. But we get to the last of the judges, Samuel and Samuel, his uh, sons are supposed to take over and the people say, Hey, they're not like you, Samuel. And they demand a King. Oh boy. And Samuel is so uh, disappointed because, you know, they want a king because they want to be like the other nations and God did not want them to have a king. He was their king. And Samuel is so upset and feels like that he's being rejected and God tells Samuel, hey, it's not you. You're, they're rejecting. It's me. They're rejecting. So uh, even though being warned, they get a king. And that king is Saul. Saul is the first king of Israel, and he is from the tribe of Benjamin. Let's go look at 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 10, and we're going over to verse 1. <clears throat> Then Samuel took the flask of oil and poured it on his head, kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you as ruler over his inheritance? So here we see that, uh, uh, you know, it's just one place. We can look at other, but we see kind of how these things start with Samuel. So the story of Saul is one that doesn't really go well. Um... He basically uh, he begins to have Saul issues. If, you know, it kind of the only way a person could say it, I guess, is a lot of it just seems to go to his head. Uh, he's from the littlest tribe, Benjamin, but in the end, you know, he's wanting to make statues of himself and just just lots of things. Uh, he oversteps his bounds on sacrifice, and God basically tells him he's going to remove him from the kingdom. Along comes David. Now, David, you know, if you are still just learning the basics, uh, David and Goliath is a story that I'm sure you're well familiar with. And knowing the story of David and Goliath, um, you might also know that David was a king. And he would be the king who took Saul's place. Now, it wouldn't be like our election that we do in our country that way, uh, you know, it was, he was picked by, by God. Let's go over to first Samuel 16, 13 here and look at this text. First Samuel chapter 16 and we go to verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Saul arose and went to Ramah. Now, this was uh, a scripture where it points out that he was anointed as king, but it doesn't mean he's king yet. It's going to be a while. In fact, um, you know, we're, we're it, it really the event of fighting David and Goliath, you know, and David is just a, a very young man, a, a boy, basically. He wasn't even old enough to really be with the rest of the fighters. He was just uh, coming out to his brothers, and whenever he did, uh, you know, he found out that this Goliath was there, and he, he would fight him, and... Uh, you know, he ends up doing it with a slingshot is what, what he does. And he kills Goliath. 
uh, Saul has promised, you know, his daughter in marriage and just big things for the person who would do it. Uh, to make a long story short, basically the people kind of take to David and he's, he's quite the soldier that he becomes, but you know, it's like, you know, David, uh, has just killed so many more than Saul, you know, like, uh, Saul has killed thousands and David has killed tens of thousands. And that did not set well with Saul. And it's just the, the chase is on. And Saul has kind of been left by God. He's still king of Israel, but things are not good there. And he tries to take David's life. And David has the opportunity to take his life. You know, to make a long story short, uh, towards the later part of Saul's reign, David ends up in a place called Ziglag. Uh, and it's in Philistine territory. He's living with the Philistines, basically. And he ends up at the last battle uh, he is going to to go into that's going to actually be the battle that Saul dies in is David is like marching out with the Philistines trying to keep his cover that he's not really for the Philistines. So, you know, he's got his mighty men with him. And uh, in the end, at the same time this is going on, uh, Saul is over on the other side and he is trying to find any way to find out what's going to happen. He goes to a witch in Endor and he finds out that basically him and his, his son's going to die in battle uh, tomorrow. So that's what he finds out. So whenever the battle rages by that time, David has been sent back by the Philistine King. Cause the, the other generals in the Philistine army don't want David going out there. They think David is not for them. The King thinks he is anyway. Uh, David goes back and the mighty men go back and they get back to Ziglag, uh, and the place has been raided. Their wives are gone. Make a long story short. They do get all those those things back, but things were really bad for David. Um, in all this, the battle to ensues and Saul and his son dies. Uh, Jonathan dies in this battle. Saul dies in this battle. And it looks like David is going to be king. Well, he kind of is. At least he is king of Judah, which is where David is from. And with this, we begin to start seeing a little bit of separation because there is some other uh, of the country, other tribes that go to this fellow by the name of Ishbosheth, which is uh, Saul's son, I believe, is Ishbosheth. Um, I'm yeah, I believe he was one who was left who would take the reign. And then he gets murdered before it's over with. And then the other tribes come and they want to be under the reign of David too. So we basically have all the tribes coming. Now let's look at 2 Samuel 5.4 is about where we made it to. Now everything I told you about the Ishbosheth and David stuff took place about seven years, I believe, is the time frame of that. So it actually took quite a while for this, uh, for this little bit of a split kingdom to come into one. So let me get over here to this second uh, Samuel 5 4 the <laughs> best thing to do is to read all this because I am skimming at best <clears throat> it says uh, in second Samuel 5 4 David was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned 40 years okay and we read the verse of four you know he became ruler over Israel so basically uh, here and I think we look at verse verse five here. It says that Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over Israel and Judah. So his total reign was 40 years. But you see that we had about seven years. He didn't have it all. So finally, he's got the whole entire, all of Israel is under David's rule. And they are one. And this is something that we have not seen. Now, his, his kingdom expands. But I have to say... It's a troubled reign. You know, he was considered a, a, a warrior, a man of blood. And it was, he wanted to build a temple for God, uh, which we didn't have. But uh, the, the ark came to Jerusalem during the time of David's reign. So everything kind of returns when David's there and we get all of Israel. So we, we really have something that's uh, pretty amazing that takes place under David's rule and things begin to grow. 
Once David dies, Solomon becomes king, and he once again is king over all of Israel. When Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. He built high places for Kamesh and the detestable idol of Moab. So he gets into idolatry. Um, and then it says in verse 8, Thus he did for all his foreign wives he, who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So Solomon, who was so wise, seemed just to fall into these uh, terrible things. But l look what God says here. In verse 12, he said, Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days, talking about the kingdom, because he said in, in verse 11, he said, uh, so the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and because you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, what I, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. So he's telling him, Hey, the kingdom is going to be torn out of your hand. But then, um, you know, he, he says this little part in here, God tells him, however, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So, you know, we see that uh, Solomon, his heart's been torn away. God doesn't like it. He says, I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you. But he's going to, you can tell by reading this, that he's going to separate the kingdom. We're going to go into a divided kingdom. And that's exactly what happens. The kingdom divides. Now, Judah is going to have a king uh, here, <clears throat> and that is uh, Rehoboam. Now, let me explain that whenever Rehoboam, Solomon's son, first takes reign, he is actually over Judah and Israel both. Solomon has, uh, it's been a very wealthy increase during his reign. So lots of things have happened that have basically caused a financial burden upon the people. And uh, Rehoboam, they want to know, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to, are we going to be taxed like, like we are with your dad or what? Rehoboam, he doesn't take wise counsel from the older elders. He takes it from his friends and he comes back and tells the people, hey, I'm going to tax you even more. It's going to be double what you've seen from my dad. It's going to be bad. Well, that doesn't do anything but tear the kingdom apart. That's where the separation comes. And that's where we get the divided kingdom. The kingdom divides of uh, Israel and Judah. That's what we have here now. We have Judah which is made up of Judah and Benjamin. Little Benjamin there is kind of swallowed up in Judah. And Israel is ten tribes. So we got the ten tribes on Israel's side. And the two tribes are, you know, basically it's Judah. It's called Judah, but Benjamin is in there. But it's just, you know, it's such a small tribe and it's kind of swallowed up. So what we have is Rehoboam is king over in, um, in Judah. And that is Solomon's son. And we have <clears throat> Jeroboam, who is king of Israel. And God had already told him that he was going to be king of Israel through a prophet. But uh, ugh, Jeroboam is bad. You know, he ends up setting up two golden idols, two golden calves that he puts in both Bethel and Dan. We see that uh, even though God warns him, uh, he, he's a bad king and all the kings of Israel that follow him are bad kings. Judah, on the other hand, has good kings and bad kings. They're an assortment. But, um, you know, let's, let's look at that first Kings chapter 12, verse 16 to kind of get a biblical perspective on this <clears throat> first Kings chapter 12 and verse 16. Okay. When all of Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, this is that event I was telling you about a while ago, the people answered the king saying, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now look after your own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents. 
Now, Rehoboam thought that, uh, you know, he was going to try to bring these guys back. And uh, whenever he did, he found out from, from God that uh, this was a thing of God. And uh, you just don't, don't go up and try to, uh, and try, try to do anything. Um, in verse 24, 1 Kings 12, 24, thus says the Lord, you must not go up and fight against your relatives, the sons of Israel, return every man to his house for this thing has come from me. So basically he says, Hey, don't fight against Israel. It's a waste of your time. I've done this. Okay. So that's what happens with the kingdom. Kingdom divides. The divided kingdom. Um, the best thing for you to do is to read probably 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. <clears throat> really, if you read 1 and 2 Kings, I think you get the big picture of things. And if you just wanted about the divided kingdom, probably pick up in chapter 12 of 1 Kings, and that'll kind of put you on the road to where this thing is going. And you can see how it goes downhill. So what we have during this time is prophets and prophecies and warnings. And God telling the people that they better straighten up. And then God telling the people what's going to happen to them. You know, they're they're in idolatry. They're uh, following other gods. Uh, same thing. And there are just all kinds of things going on. And God is warning them. Such is the prophecy of Amos 9.9, 9. and I want to show that to you. So we're going to go now to Amos 9.9, 9. and this is a fairly important prophecy to this study right here. That's why I've brought out this one in particular. So we go down here to Amos 9.9, 9, and it says, For behold, I am commanding, I will shake the house of Israel among all nations, as grain is shaken in the in a sieve, but not a kernel will fall to the ground. Now, I brought up that particular prophecy because I wanted you to notice something. It says, Behold, I am commanding, I will shake the house of Israel. It is very important that we understand that we are in a divided kingdom, and there is a house of Judah, and there is a house of Israel. And that is going to show itself in the prophecies. Whenever we begin to read the prophets, it's important at times that we notice when and where these things are being said to who that they're being said. So if you went to your Bible and you begin to look at date and timelines, you can kind of get an idea for when these writers are writing. And then often we can look at the context. So what I'm saying to you here is this statement right here in Amos 9.9 9 is said to the house of Israel. They're bad. They're getting worse. And it says, Behold, I am commanding, I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations as grain is shaken in a sieve, but not a kernel will fall to the ground. So we have this prophecy that basically Israel is going to be dispersed among the nations and they're going to be shaken, you know, in such a way that it just looks like, wow, what just happened here? But then it says not a kernel will fall to the ground. So that last part is kind of confusing. It's like, okay, how do you shake these among the nations, but yet not a kernel falls to the ground? Okay. Now, also, there's some prophecy about the house of Israel in Hosea. So I want to go over there and look at these prophecies here. Israel is warned once again. And we're going to Hosea chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses uh, 2 through 11. Now, if you've never read through Hosea, it, you know, this is pretty hard to uh, <clears throat> really get, uh, you know, wrap our minds around. Okay, Hosea's wife and children, it says in the title here. Start in verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry, yep, you read that right, and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. Yep, you sure did understand that right. So, uh, what happens? He takes a wife. Her name is Gomer. 
Now, this wife, whose name is Gomer, bears him son, just like that God wanted him to. And we look down in verse three or verse four. Let me bring this up here. Here we are in verse four. Now, the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel. This is their firstborn son here. For yet a little while, I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. Now, let me tell you here, um, and, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Let me tell you, you're going to get lost right here if you've never read anything about the divided kingdom. Because Jehu would be, um, I, I would call him the enforcer of Israel. Um, after Ahab and Jezebel, when, and you, if you haven't, if those names don't ring any bells to you, you know, they're, he's king of Israel, not king of Judah, king of Israel, house of Israel, and Jezebel's his wife. Um, if you read about those two, they, you know, the kingdom probably just, it takes a terrible downturn during their time as far as their worship and, uh, their sacrifice to other gods and Jezebel's connection to the Phoenician gods is just, you know, that's where she kind of came from. So her connection there is so strong. She keeps dragging that stuff in Israel. This would also be the time that we saw Elijah on Mount Carmel. Well, after that takes place, God brings Jehu in and he is an enforcer if there ever was one. And he is a man of blood if there ever was one. So whenever we're reading uh, about this, um, although God put him in, uh, he just went above and beyond really what maybe that he should have done to do this. And, you know, basically uh, for the blood that was shed there, uh, God says that, look, I will punish the house of Jehu for what he did. And it says, I will put an end. Let me get you back over here. I've got you back over here. It says, I will put an end, an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So, you know, this first son that Gomer, this wife of har harlotry has right here, of Hosea's wife, that first child is to be Jezreel. And basically, it has to do with the punishment and putting an end to the house of Israel. Okay, now let's go down here to verse 6. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Nave her, name her lo Rahama." For I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would forgive them. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God, but and will not deliver them by bow, bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. Okay, so here Gomer has another child. And this one here is a girl. And this one here, Lo Rahama, is her name. And basically, uh, it's said that upon this child that uh, I will not have compassion on the house of Israel, and I won't forgive them. But did you notice that God goes on to say, I will have compassion on the house of Judah. So what I need you to be doing right now is to start noticing that there's a house of Judah and there's a house of Israel, and they're spoken of separately in Scripture because, you know, these things are kind of going to be important to us uh, as we continue on. So let's go back to this text here again, and let's look a little further with it. And this is a really good spot for you to be following along, guys and gals, with your Bibles. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to verse 8. And when she had weaned Lo Rahama, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured by or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. Well, now that is really interesting. And let's go on and let's look at verse 11. And the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together and they will appoint for themselves one leader and they will go up to the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Well, talk about some confusing property prophecies. Israel is to go away. They're not going to be God's people anymore. Um, house of Judah uh, is, you know, God's going to have compassion on them and mercy, but he's not going to have mercy on the house of Israel. 
But then at the very tail end, it says even though that all this stuff is going to happen to uh, Israel, uh, their numbers will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured. Measured, And it says where it is said that you are not my people, it will be said that you are the sons of the living God. And then in the last, it says, and the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together. So, you know, we begin to see some of these prophecies that uh, people look to today from the Old Testament here. So you guys got to keep all this stuff in your mind. Now, let's also go to Hosea chapter 2, uh, verse 24. And hopefully it's beginning to come clear why we did a lot of this research in the Old Testament so we could get to this point and begin to, you know, understand the things that were uh, being talked about um, whenever we got here to the prophets. Okay, here we go. Verse 23, I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Um, you know, we, we have this, this prophecy that's in Hosea that, you know, basically I, uh, Israel, house of Israel, you're not my people. I will not have mercy on you. I will not have compassion. But then, you know, I will say, you're my people. Okay. Ugh. Try to keep all this in your minds and think about it. Okay, um, let's see. The house of Israel, uh, Amos 9.9 9, that we talked about. Do you guys remember that scripture uh, in Amos 9.9? 9? Okay, well, let me go back there just to make sure that you do. Uh, we just talked about it just here a minute ago. It was about the house of Israel, Amos 9.9. 9 says, for behold, I am commanding and I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations as grain is shaken in the sieve, but not a kernel will fall to the ground. Okay. Now you remember that. Okay. Now I want us to go to second Kings 1811 because in second Kings 1811 is the fulfillment of that verse. So let's go and see how this is fulfilled in real time. Second Kings 1811 is where we're going to. Now, if you're really new to this, you might be saying, well, the book of Amos is past the book of 2 Kings. I don't understand. Well, understand it like this. Um, you have the, the things that are taking place in 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles, you know, for the most part are written later. The prophecies that the prophets that we have, they're not like intertwined. In other words, whenever an event takes place in uh, chapter 14 of, of uh, 1 Kings, doesn't mean that right there, you know, we have the minor prophet that spoke about it. You know, they're in books over here, but those books coincide with events that's taken place in first Kings and second Kings. Okay. Understand. So Amos nine, nine, you know, the prophecy come earlier and then in second Kings, 1811, it is fulfilled. So second Kings, 1811, it says, then the King of Assyria carried Israel away into exile to Assyria and put them in Hala and in the harbor and the river Gozan and the city of the Medes. And they were basically shaken among the nations. That's exactly what happened. You see, whenever Assyria took uh, Israel into captivity, <coughs> excuse me, they didn't go into Israel and say, okay, you guys are now under Assyrian control and you're going to do this. That's not how they did it. Whenever they took them into captivity, what they did is they took the people out of that area and they spread them among the other nations, obviously to weaken them and not give them any strength. But that's what happened just exactly as God had promised. And those events take place in 722 BC is whenever Israel is scattered among the nations and they just kind of disappear out there. You know, they... Uh, no doubt they settled, they made families, they made homes, and uh, they just kind of disappear from the scene. Now, 
The House of Judah, on the other hand, remains for a little while. They don't just go away at the same time that the House of Israel does, but at the same time, you know, they have a good king, and then they have a bad king, and then they have a good king, and then they have a worse king. And, you know, it comes down to the last king and... Uh, Jeremiah is heavy on the scene at that time. People like Daniel are writing around that time. And in fact, if you read in Jeremiah and you read in Daniel, you'll see how these events took place in waves as they were taken away and as Jerusalem was about to be destroyed and the temple, uh, the old temple would be destroyed and those things would take place. But ultimately, it was uh, taken captive in 586 B.C. by Babylon. On, and that would be Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe that's a name that you've heard from, uh, heard of. But it was prophesied to return in 70 years uh, by Jeremiah, is who had prophesied that. If we go to Jeremiah chapter 25, let me get you over here. Jeremiah. Uh, there you are, Jeremiah chapter 25. Verse 11. Okay. The whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be, when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon, and that nation declares the Lord for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, I will make it an everlasting desolation. Well, you know, prophecies are always a little bit hard for us to read, but what's being said there is basically that Judah is going to be in captivity for 70 years, and then you're going to return. And that is exactly what happened. You see, after uh, that time, we would have the books of Ezra and Nehemiah is what we would have that would have uh, would have. Uh, come into uh, whenever you read First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah tell of the rebuilding of the walls and the rebuilding of the temple. Okay, wow, guys, we have covered a lot of territory uh, in these last two studies, and I know some of you are saying we didn't make it anywhere. We're still stuck in the Old Testament, and I don't know any more than I did whenever I started. Well, I hope that's not true. I hope there's some things that we're covering that maybe you've missed before. And if you haven't, you're a really good student in the Old Testament and you already know all these things, then I promise you this next lesson, we're going to bring it full circle and we're going to explain why these things have been so important to help us understand better this things that are happening in the New Testament, things that people teach on the end times, and what the truth is about our situation and about the situation of that. So please hang with me. Next study, it all comes full circle. You'll be you know, go back and look at these scriptures again because I'll assure you, you're going to want to look at them again after this is over as you begin to put the puzzle pieces together of why we've been doing this. All right, see you next time.